Hey guys, welcome to the Kane Audio vlog. It's Friday, it's time for another Ask Me Anything. Usual rules apply, comment anything you want below this video and I'll get to you in next week's video. Uh, before I get on to last week's video, cover house admin first. Uh, first of all, uh, a special welcome because this is the 50th AMA. Um, which I am really proud to have made it this far into them uh, and hopefully we'll do 50 more. Uh, so thanks to everyone who's followed. I know there's some of you in particular who've asked questions almost every week for 50 weeks, which is amazing. Um, thanks to you guys, because essentially uh, everyone watching this video, you're, you're the guys that control this content, really. Um, I don't really get a say in what we talk about. So, yeah, a huge thank you to everyone for that. Um, what else has happened this week? Uh, oh, uh, I can now announce that my next EP has just been signed by Mousetrap. Uh, more details very soon on that. And aside from that, uh, what else is there? Uh, what have I done this week? Oh, I'll tell you something else I've done this week. Got another camera. It's only a cheap Canon thingy. Um, so, I am one step closer. Oh, it's bleeping at me now. Lens cover. Yeah. Um, I am one step closer to finally sorting out the Kane Audio podcast series uh, where I will be interviewing various producers and people from the music industry. Uh, I kind of want it to be a bit of everything so don't expect huge celebrities or anything straight away because that's not the idea necessarily although it'd be nice to have the odd sprinkling of one uh, every now and then. Um, but the main focus is going to be kind of like these AMAs, I guess, in that it's about discussing what people do in the industry, how many different routes there are in this industry, how to get into the industry, uh, various different things like that. So it's going to be more of a sort of casual uh, sitting down with someone. Uh, so, for example, I've got someone who does music for TV, film, sync stuff. Um, I've got another one who deals predominantly in music publishing. Uh, I'll have guys from record labels and obviously lots of producers, sound designers, the usual sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so I'm a step closer to that, which is good news. Uh, what else have we got going on? I think that's about it for this week. Uh, so on with the show. Let's have a look at last week's questions. Uh, Nightquaker, that intro is great. Heck yeah, Dom. Cheers. Uh, Nightquaker, hey Dom, uh, I'm curious about something. Have you ever been involved in sound-related scientific projects, like converting the signals from space into audio, or maybe configuration of some sort of scientific equipment, etc.? No, not really. Um, so I did a few bits and pieces in university. I wouldn't say I contributed much to science. However, I did a couple of weeks ago have an interesting meeting with a professor of a university round here. And uh, we did talk about some scientific products that help disabled people um, and that talk will be ongoing so oddly enough I kind of am looking in that area at the moment just because I think there's an area of interest that I had an idea and I'm kind of running with it so maybe don't know um, Jakku music sup Dom music high five uh, I've been watching these almost as a religion for the past year, so thank you for that. Thank you for watching. Uh, I do have a left field question. Red Dwarf, are you a fan? Oh man, Red Dwarf. Uh, do you know what? I'm going to say something controversial here. 
I was a fan and I struggle to say that I am a fan now because uh, look when it was on in the 90s I loved it it was hilarious um, but I think it was what channel was it I can't remember there was a channel that ran a bunch of reruns um, probably four or five years ago and and I thought great Red Dwarf that was brilliant uh, and uh, I watched probably two or three episodes and just thought yeah it's not really aged well um, so yeah so I, I was a fan I can't call myself a fan anymore but I'm a fan of the nostalgia so yeah there we go uh, Robin Kirkup congrats on the 50th Don thank you very much uh, what would be your best tip for punchier kicks and snares? Also, what tip could you give to have maximum impact when a track kicks back in after a breakdown? Okay, so best tip for punchier kicks and snares. This is going to sound really silly, but picking the right kicks and snares in the first place. Um, but on that note, I will also say that if you're only listening to kicks and snares, say you're starting your production and you've, you're just you're starting with the kicks and snares, they're all going to sound punchy. So you need to always come back to your kicks and snares later on. Um, pick the heavy punchy ones, whatever it is for the vibe of the track you're going for at the beginning, and then later on when you're say three quarters of the way through you've kind of nailed the arrangement the the everything's kind of starting to get into place now it's at that point i would always uh try and especially the kicks just try and replace the kick um you know mute the kicks channel and try some different kicks um because once you've built up that track especially things like the bass line the leads you know it, it, there's a lot of things that change a track whether you're using eighth note hi-hats or sixteenth note hi-hats that changes the whole vibe of, of a groove um, if you're using big long extended bass notes or if you're using short stabby bass notes they can have a real impact on on how a kick or snare or clap or any of these things come across so um, I think when you're sort of three quarters of the way through a track you need to kind of review the kicks and just make sure that you did pick the right ones um, so my best advice is don't worry too much until you're at that point where you've got the overall vibe of the track and everything's starting to fall into place that's the best time to start looking at the punchy kicks and just preview a bunch of different kicks while playing the track and just keep replacing it with a different kick and you will well while you're scrolling through um, I know for example in Bitwig if you're using the drum machine you can preview different kicks and just scroll through the kicks and if you, the drum machine has a loop of triggers um, it'll just continue triggering those kicks so it's a piece of piss to just run through them all. Um, yeah that's probably the, the best tip I have for finding punchy kicks is start with punchy kicks. Um, other than that um, you know the, <laughs> Bringing out things like transients and, and the body and a bit of EQ on a kick can, can help it be a bit more punchy. Um, and uh, equally kind of taking out some of the lesser wanted. Um, so, but again, it's, it's hard to, there's no hard and fast rule for all kicks because it depends on the kind of track you're doing. Um, yeah, because I, yeah, I can't really say one frequency or another because if you want subby kicks then you need lots of sub um, whereas if you're doing a big EDM track or something then you probably don't want too much sub in your kicks um, <clears throat> so yeah I can't really name specific frequencies uh, as for maximum impact when a track kicks back after a breakdown so my biggest tip for that really is bring everything down in the mix so automate it um, but one thing I will say is this is the kind of tip you should really only consider in the mix down when you've pretty much finished your track your arrangement is nailed nothing's going to move because once you've done this it's a nightmare to shift things around 
but let's say for example you have a big snare roll you've got a couple of risers you've got some crash cymbals you've got uh, let's say your bass line and some chords and stabs and bits and pieces that's all going on it's building up building up building up and you want everything to come blasting in well really the only difference between those two sections is what your kicks and hats and percussion and bits and pieces like that so it's not going to be a huge impact the best way to do that is to, to get more impact is uh, throughout your breakdown let's say your breakdown is a minute long even though you've got a snare roll building up and what did I say risers and things like that leading up to your drop bring every channel down in level by say three maybe even four db over that minute um, just make it as subtle as you can so probably three db is enough and what happens is everything just gradually gets quieter until the drop and then all of a sudden you can let go of those those automations and go back to whatever db you were at in the first place but essentially everything becomes 3 db louder um, and that i find has a, a really big impact the other thing then is using silence one of the things i've often found if you if you've got a huge build up and your drop doesn't quite seem to smack you in the face like you wanted um, one of the best ways around that is to take advantage of that by offering some silence so have your build up have everything build up and reach that sort of crescendo moment but then just kill everything for say a bar maybe even two bars just a little bit of reverb on a cymbal or a really quiet sound maybe just one reverse cymbal throughout one bar and then bring everything in and just by by having that one bar of silence the listener's ears suddenly go oh this is what you know silence sounds like this is what normal life sounds like so then when everything kicks back in about later um, it just has a much bigger impact um, yeah sometimes I find less is more but I think that's probably because all of my frequencies are overlapping when I have more going on at a guess still learning uh, what would you suggest many thanks um, yeah so I would say it's probably less about frequencies but actually maybe that's another thing is with your breakdown, try and remove all the low end, especially towards the drop. So where I was saying bring everything down by 3 dB, if you've got a rolling bass line that's going throughout your breakdown, um, just high pass filter it a little bit. So let's say your, your, your fundamental bass line is at, I don't know, 80 hertz or something. Um, just slowly automate the low end below 80 hertz out of it and maybe up to even 90 maybe even 100 hertz or something so it really starts to weaken uh, just before the kicks and everything come back in so that when you then bring it back in um, I think bass is one of the most impactful sounds especially in a club that's the one you feel in your chest so if you can slowly scoop that out without the listener really noticing too much then when it does come thundering back in it's going to have much bigger impact uh, Andrew Hollis, music, high five. Uh, congrats on the 50th AMA. Uh, I started late to the vlog after stumbling across you as a guest on Lowering the Tone podcast last year. Uh, yeah, that was a good podcast. I enjoyed that. Anyone uh, who does download podcasts, audio ones, um, do check out. It's uh, Meet Katie, uh, Lowering the Tone. It's a really, really good podcast. Um, I did also see you a columnist on Future Music Magazine. Yes, I did a few columns for him. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think that producer dance electronic music scene is more or less clicky than when you started off? Uh, I get the impression that some producers have got to where they are with the help of mates or a collective. Once they have made it, uh, the ladder goes up and they don't pay back to the next generation. Um, I think it's always been clicky but in different ways so when I first started I guess I mean you always had you know there were I think you know 
back in the 90s and whatever, you had engineering people, you had creative writer people, and then you had the business A&R people. Um, and, and those three people, obviously there was an overlap because you're all working towards the same end goal, really. Um, but within each group, there was definitely clicky areas. Um, but I think over time, you know, the last 20 years, the, those three branches have kind of all merged into one. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's, you know, the industry has changed a lot. But I don't think people have changed. So I think there there always was, there always is, and there always will be clicky people in the industry. Um, my advice is always just don't bother with them. If someone's clicky, then they're not they're not for me. That's how I see it. You know, um, I've I've in my in the early mid parts of my career where it started taking off there were uh, certain groups of people who were very clicky and and very accepting of me because I had certain things that they I suppose saw as an advantage to them or whatever you know things like my residency at Ministry of Sound and things like that um, but the moment I worked out that they were really only accepting of me for that reason I just I had no interest in giving them that you know it's just not uh, I just don't play politics in music um, or I try not to anyway I don't think I do but it's one of those things you know there's there's politics in everything and I guess you know we're in a, a, a day and age now where anybody can be a producer anybody can be an A&R manager anybody can be an audio engineer and and this is a good thing, um, you know, as much as it feels shit sometimes, uh, for me, I think it's very much a good thing. You know, it, it levels the playing field. Um, but you're always going to get clicky people because at the end of the day, people are humans and humans are trash. Uh, so there we go. Um, as for some producers have got to where they are with the help of mates or a collective, absolutely and i see a lot of it these days as well which is great to see um in fact you know if you look at in fact a lot of my followers are members of certain groups and i see on twitter and stuff there will be a a, a, a group of producers who like and retweet my stuff and and i can see that they're liking and retweeting each other and helping each other um, and that's great and in fact that's one of the reasons why i set up my uh, Facebook producer group um, was for that exact reason so that people can chat to each other so that you guys can chat to each other and you know get some advice on anything from mix downs to production to whatever you want really um, and I think that's that's really important um, and something I've probably made clear several times on these videos is that I've got certain mates in the industry who <clears throat> I've met maybe early on in my career or whatever and there are certain ones who I will do anything for if they want a remix I'm there if they want a release I'll do what I can you know if they want uh, some help plugging something I'll do it because they're genuine nice people and they're friends of mine and I will always help them and be loyal to them um, whereas there are other people that I meet who literally only ever get in touch for those things and those are the kinds of people where I'm like I have no interest in helping that person um, so yeah I don't know uh, I guess that kind of answers your question um, I guess the point is is you're always going to have this in it's not just a music industry thing as well as much as it feels like it it's probably exactly the same for accountants or I don't know whatever you know there's probably clicky people in accountancy circles um, funnily enough I don't know who they are but uh, I'm sure they're there um, as for once they've made it up the ladder and they take the ladder with them yeah I guess that probably does happen but again that comes down to just people being trash um, I hope that I'm not one of those people and you know I think evidence of that is 
well, these weekly AMAs for a start. Um, I've never been one to sort of hold everything close to my chest and stay silent. Um, I think at the end of the day, if someone's got some talent, you know, there's plenty of room in the industry for all of us. Um, so I, I don't see the point in being a dick, basically. Um, but God knows there's enough out there. Anyway, Fin Fighter, music, high five, very cool intro. Uh, question is, have you had a Korg MS-20 Mini and what you liked about its features and can it be go-to synth like you have your Moog Sub-37? <coughs> the MS-20 Mini, if I, I haven't tried the Mini, but I have tried the MS-20, the original. Um, as far as I'm aware, I'm gonna check this. Um, Uh, I've just written KS20, MS20, um, and I'm just going to quickly look at images because with the original you couldn't store any kind of presets or anything like that and I'm guessing it's the same with the mini. Uh, what have we got here? VCOs, VCFs, envelopes. Yeah, patches, yeah, so I don't think there's any way of saving patches. So, would it be a, a, a go-to synth? Probably not, um, because if you made an awesome lead and patched it in, um, especially when you've got cables to plug and unplug, you know, that's a lot to remember, so if you then make a different sound and you want to go back to the previous sound you can't you can't do it again so uh, for me personally I've mentioned before that I personally don't save many presets on my Moog um, I like to delete it and start again but that's because I'm a sound designer and I enjoy sound design so for me that's kind of the enjoyable moment of production is is making the sounds in the first place um, whereas for a lot of people that's not going to be the fun bit the fun bit for them is finding the sound and then going with it doing whatever it is they want to do um, so I would say if you enjoy experimenting and sound design uh, then yeah it's probably a great go-to synth um, because um, you know the, the the MS-20 really does have some great sounds and it's a great uh, you know that it's a unique uh, filter on there as well so it's got a very unique sound um, which is great and it can make your productions unique but uh, does it even have MIDI in and out? I'm guessing the new one does the old one didn't that was CVs I think um, so again you've just got to be aware of that really um, you know it, I know a lot of people have bought the Sub-37 uh, that have spoken to me on Instagram, Twitter, wherever, and they've ended up getting rid of it because they didn't like how clumsy it was to save presets and things like that. Um, because if you come from a computer world, just Apple S or Control S or whatever, you know, saving a preset or saving a sound is one click. Whereas on an analog synth like the Sub-37, it's, well, a lot of clicks because you've got to go through the menu and you've got to turn the, the, the wheel to be able to go through the alphabet to save the preset name and then save the preset location in a bank. Um, you know, it to save a preset on the Sub-37 for me takes a minute, maybe two minutes. Um, now, again, for me, coming from an analogue world of synthesizers, that's lightning quick. That's amazing for me. But I can understand if you're coming from a computer world and the digital working in the box world, then two minutes to save a preset can utterly destroy your workflow. So those are the things to kind of consider and, and as much as I love analog synths I totally understand they're not for everyone um, for those reasons so you need to be able to ask yourself 
do you need to be able to save presets? If so, do you need to be able to do it really quickly and recall them quickly? Uh, if so, then the Korg MS-20 is probably not for you. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, and I'm just going to hit re-record on this because I can see I'm approaching 30 minutes already or near enough. Um, and on that note, uh, I found out why my camera keeps stopping itself on the 30 minute mark. And this has been one of the problems I've had in looking to film the podcast that I want to do. Um, the reason is, is because in Europe, there is a different tax on video cameras compared to photography cameras. And they classify a video camera as anything that can film video for 30 minutes or more. So that's why it cuts out on 29 minutes and 59 seconds. It's because uh, Canon and every other DSLR maker apparently uh, doesn't want to pay the extra tax for it being a video camera. And I did look into it and it's a substantial amount more tax. So I, I kind of get it. Um, yeah, so the only way around that is basically from what I worked out is either a camcorder, which is why I've got that little Canon one down there. Um, although the video quality is nowhere near as good as this one, so that's gonna really annoy me. Um, or the other alternative is a Panasonic GH5, because apparently they pay the tax and you can do like an hour and 20 minutes of 4K or something. Basically, it's limited to the size of the SD card. So, yeah, there we go. But I don't have a spare 1500 quid to throw at a second camera. So there we go. Uh, right, next one. Ricky John, music, high five. Hi, Dom. Uh, didn't get around to commenting last time. Double shifts, saving for first hardware. Ooh. Uh, although I did watch. Uh, was quite glad the question of recording in too hot and cold came up. Near perfect timing. So thanks for your, uh, thanks to you and the questioner. Uh, normal first question first. Uh, could you talk about how you got the smooth lead sound in Psychoschematics? Really like that sound. Um, do you know what? Did I do a... No, I didn't. Or did I? Did I do a, a, a tutorial on that? I don't remember doing it, but then I don't remember much of what I do. Uh, Psycho Schematics, let's have a listen. Damn, there's a lot of versions. Oh, that's video, that's why. Right, let's have a listen very quietly. The lead in that... I'm pretty sure it's the Moog Sub-37. Everything is. Yeah, it is. Um, but I couldn't tell you how I did it. Um, it's just going to be a saw wave. So it's a saw wave. The filter envelope I've got opening the filter obviously. Uh, fairly short decay. Uh, a fairly long attack ish by normal standards. It's not an attack of zero. There's a, there's a, a ramp to the attack then a short decay. Uh, very low sustain, I don't know what the release is, but the important part for that is that I think I did, uh, was it reverb then delay, or delay then reverb, you'll have to experiment, but I also set essentially a ping pong delay, and then lots of extended reverb on that, but I also set the delay and reverb effects to only effect so I lifted the low cuts basically so it 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 only affects the higher frequency signals which basically meant that while it was roomy and reverby at most frequencies when you open that filter uh, that's when the delay and reverb really has a, a much more uh, impact I suppose um, yeah other than that, I don't think there's much else to that. Uh, it's not particularly difficult sound to make. Um, I probably have two oscillators at the most, two voices at the most, probably. 
Um, so yeah, really simple sound. Um, random congratulatory uh, 50th AMA question. What is or are your biggest pet peeves? Okay, music industry pet peeves. I would say people that put too much importance on numbers like Facebook likes and all of that stuff um, or people who put too much importance on image in the music industry as well um, that's I suppose a pet peeve it doesn't really annoy me that much but it's just not something I agree with uh, pet peeves in normal life I don't know I can't I must have millions I, I'm not I'm not going to pretend I don't have any because uh, people annoy me I would say probably um, drivers that aren't aware of things happening further down the road than in front of their face uh, that tends to bug me um, because it's just a daily occurrence um, but that's about it really, that's, that's all I can think of, I can't think of anything else. Uh, congrats on the 50th AMA my man, thank you very much. Uh, Rod Marconi, music, high five. Hi Don, thanks again for sharing your thoughts and tips in regards to music production. Question, uh, you have been in the music business for a long time now, have you still got ambitions and dreams that you aspire to? Absolutely yes, and I think the moment they go is the moment I quit, um, I, I think it's ambitions and dreams are, are what keep us going um, as for what they are I guess they kind of change they evolve I suppose and and they always have done so before I got into the industry um, I mean even from earliest childhood uh, I wanted to be I wanted to be able to be on stage performing music um, I always was desperate to just show people music that I liked and, and um, I was always desperate to be able to write music um, because uh, I've never been very good at expressing myself emotionally whereas I can express myself musically uh, it feels more natural so that was always a big thing so then obviously that that led to things like DJing and producing um, and then as I kind of ticked those boxes you know I wanted to do bigger better crowds or bigger better music or get signed to this label or that label um, and clearly now I've I've you know ticked a lot of those boxes uh, there are still things I'd like to do so I, I, I would like to write a full original soundtrack for a sci-fi movie and I mean Hollywood sci-fi movie big budget stuff um, big stress probably a nightmare job but I love the reward you get from that in terms of the satisfaction I love great sci-fi films I love sci-fi film music um, <laughs> So yeah, so there's still loads of dreams and ambitions there and and pro if I'm realistic, it's probably not one I'm ever going to do because there are very few composers out there who manage to get themselves a good Hollywood blockbuster movie. Um, so it, no matter whether I had the skill or not, which I don't think I do, but even if I did have the skill, you know, it's still highly unrealistic for me to ever get that because there's a there's probably for every one of me there's probably you know 20,000 others out there who are probably in a better position than me um so yeah but I mean I still have lots of dreams and ambitions and uh yeah there's all sorts of things that, and I guess it's there are smaller ones and bigger ones as well um but that's what kind of keeps us going, I guess, through daily uh, processes. And that's what makes us do the smaller things in life. Um, but yeah, I would say the film score one is probably the big one. Um, Demo Singo, hi Dom, music, high five. Uh, for AMA number 50, I would like to ask you, 
can you tell us how many famous DJs and producers you have met? Who are they and how did it happen? I probably couldn't even tell you how many or whatever. I, From my generation of DJs in that I'm talking so DJs that are around my age, um, probably most of them. There probably aren't many that I haven't met in one way or another, especially when, for example, I was resident at Ministry of Sound, so if you look at who was playing there every week, you know, the list of DJs, and same as when I was in space in Ibiza, you know, they had, what for, for We Love Sundays, they had probably 50 DJs on a Sunday night in four different rooms, um, you know, so there was a lot of different... Uh, professional DJs and stuff there so I, I, I couldn't even try naming one because uh, it would be easier to say who I haven't met I would imagine um, have a great weekend uh, so yeah and th then you ask how did it happen so that's probably how it happened I mean friends of friends I get introduced um, but yeah usually at gigs is, is usually when I meet these people um, yeah um, yeah, I can't think of any uh, particularly interesting anecdotes that led to those things, to be honest. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, Reality on X production. Uh, recommend me Poltec, similar to UAD one, uh, plus music. High five. Um, Poltec, I'll be honest, nobody beats the UAD if you're talking software. Um However, there's hardware. Is it Warm Audio, I think? Let me have a look. Yeah, Warm Audio, EQPWA. Um, they do uh, a Poltec hardware version, uh, which is like a remake of the original Poltec. Um, and it's mono, so as much as if you look online and you think, oh, that price is all right, don't forget you need two of them to do a stereo signal. Um, but yeah, I would recommend that because apparently, I haven't heard it myself, but apparently it's about as close as you'll ever get to the original. Uh, the UAD version is by far the best out there that I'm aware of when it comes to software. Uh, but my final recommendation of places to look is Brainworks. Uh, if you go pluginalliance.com, I think, um, Brainworks have just released uh, a version of it. Um, I have it, actually, but I haven't used it yet. Um, and I've forgotten what they've called it. Um, I won't look now, but have a look at Brainworks stuff anyway. It'll be BX something, no doubt. Um, is it Brainworks? It's on Plugin Alliance, I know that. Um, so check them out and have a look because uh, that might be good. I don't know. Um, where did I get up to? Uh, St. Nicholas, music, high five. Thanks, Dom. Uh, Yanis Lokmelis, music, high five. And then finally, Sunset 86. Uh, loved the intro to this AMA. Thank you very much. Uh, P.S. Toffos are no longer available unless you get them from the Middle East. Uh, but even then, they're not the fruit ones. Fruit ones? No, that's wrong. Uh, anyways, this is AMA 50, or will be. Yes, you're right. Uh, thanks for last week's answers. My question this week is, what do you think about Beringer, or Beringer, and its cloning and the release of remakes of old analog synths, i.e. the Pro 1, the 808, the 909, the Model D, etc.? Will you buy? So, I think it's good that they're doing it. Will I buy them? Probably not, but not for any specific reason, other than I don't think they've really made something that really grabs me. Um, but partly because, for example, the 808 and 909, I've got no interest in, in, in owning them. I had a 909 back when they were crap, and they're still crap now, so I don't understand why everybody loves the 909. The 808, I can kind of understand, but let's be real, you could recreate an 808 kick in pretty much anything these days. It's the most simple kick drum out there. 
Um, so, and they're the most oversampled things on earth. Um, I'm not slagging off, well, I kind of am slagging off the 808 and 909, only because they were crap when they came out and they were cheap and they were kind of known as being a bit cheap and, you know, a few people made some hit records with them, um, which made them really popular, which I can understand, that's fine, but they were never particularly great. They, they're, they're just classic. Um, so re-releasing new versions of them, I, I don't, it just doesn't appeal to me. I can understand other people want that classic sound and whatever, you know, much like I have the Juno, uh, the JV1080 behind me, you know, that's very much a classic sound, but, but then I got that back when it wasn't classic. So I don't know. Um, yeah. So will I buy them? Probably not, but good luck to them. I've got nothing against them. Uh, I just, it just doesn't appeal to me. Uh, at the prices they offer, it's really tempting to have those analog things and get the same kind of sound of analogs that otherwise secondhand cost in the thousands. Weird question. Uh, so yeah, I agree. Um, if you're going to go for that, if you want that sound, then yeah, go for it. Are they actually analog? I'm not sure. Probably not if it's Behringer. Um, I doubt they're making analog 808 or 909. They're the hardware, yeah, but they're probably digital hardware, so just be aware of that. Um, I can't imagine that they're analog because that wouldn't that would make them more expensive. Um, they're probably what do they call it? Virtual analog or something, which is basically digital. Um, yeah, weird question for this AMA. Do you believe in aliens? Uh, what a great question to finish this off on. Uh, so first of all, you've got to define aliens. Do I believe that there is life on some other planet somewhere out there in the universe? Uh, statistically, it's very, very likely. Um, so I'm fairly confident that yes, there's probably life out there somewhere. Do I believe in little green men? No. Um, I think it's probably more likely to be like a bacterial life form. Um, and do I think aliens have ever visited Earth? No, absolutely not. Um, it's just not even remotely scientifically possible without us knowing about it, basically. So, um, <coughs> you know, by definition of an alien life form visiting planet Earth, they would have to be so much more technologically advanced than us that there's no way that we wouldn't have known about it because we'd have been test subjects, absolutely. Um, and I don't think that they would sneak around and, uh, you know, I don't think they uh, sneak around and pick up rednecks in the middle of the night. Um, it's just not a thing. So, uh, yeah, there we go. That's my thoughts on aliens. Um, so there we go. Um, that is it for this week. Um, if you have made it this far into the video, then comment the word event to let me know that you've made it in this far and you'll get a high five in next week's video. Once again, thank you to everyone who's uh, been regularly inputting on these videos. It's been great fun. Uh, I can't believe we've done 50 already. Hopefully we'll do another 50 and uh, yeah, it's been good. Until next time, see you soon. Cheers.